second. But I uh, just want to kind of just uh, share. Uh, this is Shannon. Shannon, Hi. did you, uh, you can go ahead and hold that really quick. <laughs> Uh, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself and what you do here with HRN? Oh, cool. Okay, I'm a respiratory therapist. I have been oh, a respiratory sorry. therapist for oh, 10 Come years. On, real quick. So don't let the baby face fool you. <laughs> I um, have Video hospital video. experience. That's where I come from, hospital experience. No, just also long-term facility experience. Um, and I absolutely love it here. The patients are awesome. You see, she looks at me when she does that. Whoa! She's like, was that okay? But no, because I, I love it no, here. She does, she does. I do. I love see. it here. The patients, all of them make me just... It's a big difference from the hospital. In the hospital, I see patients deteriorate. Here, I get to see patients get better. I get to see patients get off oxygen. I get to see amazing things that I don't get to see in the hospital. So yes, it's absolutely great. All right, this is Melanie. Why don't you go in the frame here? Hi, how are you? All right, Mel, uh, just a little bit about yourself and what you do here at HRN. I teach pulmonary rehab at HRN. I've been here for about mm, three, four years now, I think. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love being able to make a difference in people's lives. I've seen so many people change. People in wheelchairs that couldn't walk, couldn't breathe. People on five liters of oxygen, not on any oxygen now. Not that that will happen for everybody, but just the things that we could do to help you to improve your quality of life is so rewarding. Now, just a, from uh, from you guys' experience and even my experience combined, um, they can hear just fine. Uh, <laughs> so with just the experience combined and everything, what do you think is the most big problem that we usually see with people coming in? Let's say they have a combination of lung and heart disease, but they always talk about what specifically that – well, what question usually comes up as a problem to them? Like, my, hey, my heart, my, my lung, my lung volumes won't go up. Uh, or maybe nutrition factor. What do you think is the, one of the most big key factors where you usually have a brand new person? What is their usual thing? Like, is it they're too weak? Is it because they don't know what to do with their exercise? Have they? How I'll many people have you seen that have went to a pulmonary rehab before? How's that? Yeah, yeah. a lot of people lot have of already people. gone to pulmonary rehab, but all the things that you've mentioned our issues all the time, but the biggest thing is I'm so short of breath. I stand up, I'm short of breath. So those are the big, that's the biggest one. What, when too. somebody's that out of breath, not to cut you off, but when somebody's that out of breath, how do we work on people that are very short-winded? So let's say somebody's a, a increasingly, like they just have a severe amount of work of breathing with their exercise. Um, after about, let's say, a month into the program where they had a fair share of good knowledge good exercise in the program, somebody that is very out of breath, how does that look after a month usually for any given, the t our typical patient with severe COPD and, and heart disease? What, like after a month, what usually, let's say, just give me an average of like, let's say somebody gets out of breath walking five feet. How far are, can some of those people go after a month? Oh, a lot, mind. a lot farther because they're going to start walking every Double, day, triple, and they're yeah. they're going to increase their walks every day so that their muscles are getting stronger, so they use less oxygen, they make less carbon dioxide, so they're going to be able to go farther sure. and farther. Okay. And use your respiratory muscle trainer. I was about to say it's amazing for patients who use them. I mean, they see results because one, they're doing what they're supposed to do, walking every sure. day biking every day. They're using their respiratory muscle trainer every single day. If you use, if you work the program, then it'll, it'll yield results. I mean, results beyond uh, what you can imagine. My patients will message me or call me all the time and go, hey, Shannon, thank you for this. I'm now able to do this and I haven't been able to do it for like three years. And I'm like, it's not me. You did it. You had to put in the work. Now, there's Amanda uh, Inners. I, I do apologize if I didn't say that name correctly, but Amanda, you asked if uh, if you have COPD, can you get off oxygen? How many people have we weaned off oxygen? A lot. A lot. Uh, yeah. You. So yes, of course. Absolutely. And somebody did a shout out. Melanie, look on there. <laughs> I can't see that <laughs> Fa far. Facebook user. <laughs> Thank you. But guys, 
Uh, we're going to have Dr. Shaw take over on here. We just want to do a quick introductory. Uh, Melly is actually in another state. She's our other respiratory <laughs> therapist, and we did hire also another respiratory therapist to come in. So uh, we obviously have a lot more, you know, a lot more people right now inside the building. It's, uh, it's us with Dr. Shaw right now uh, doing bye, bye, our I'll stuff. See you later. Bye, see you guys. Bye-bye. That, that was good. Hello everyone, welcome back. Dr. Navid Shah here, pulmonologist uh, with the Home Rehab Network. Um, I'll be answering your questions, so fire away. In the meantime, I did want to bring up um, being in the hospital, because recently um, someone I know was in the hospital. We did not really have a great experience uh, at the hospital. Um, it seemed like there was no beds um, waiting in the waiting room uh, to get into the ER uh, for a long time. And then uh, in the ER waiting to see someone. And then from there, not having a bed uh, on the, on the, in the hospital. And then waiting just in the ER for a couple of days. Uh, not a very good experience. Um, and some of you, in the, you know, out, out, out there in our, uh, in our groups uh, have definitely experienced that. Uh, me being a doctor, I've been on the other side, but now I'm seeing the other side of it too. So, um, you know, let me know about your difficulties uh, in, in, the, uh, in the hospital system because it, it's not always a, a, a pretty, pretty system. I mean, obviously, you know, one, you're sick. Uh, two, uh, you want attention because you need that attention. Uh, and, and three, Things are not always uh, as timely uh, as, uh, as you may want them, uh, and, and it's discouraging uh, a lot of times. And, and uh, believe me, I was a little bit discouraged. Um, one, that uh, the antibiotics that were being given uh, were actually the wrong antibiotics. And because, because I happened to work there, I, I had access to the uh, medical record. I could tell them, look, these are not the right antibiotics, and because I'm a doctor. Um, so that was switched, but that was something that they should really caught on their own. So, I, you know, um, I, I would say when you're going to the hospital, you know, kind of be vocal and, and ask questions. Make sure um, you're getting the medication on time. Uh, one of the antibiotics that were, you know, um, prescribed, um, it didn't even come on time. Uh, and Obviously, it wasn't the right antibiotic anyway, but regardless, it didn't even come on time. But so make sure when you're in the hospital, uh, ask questions. Um, make sure you're getting the medications. Make sure you're getting them on time. Make sure they're the right medications. Uh, and make sure that you have a, a good, comprehensive plan each day uh, that you're in the hospital uh, with your provider. Um, and, and make sure you're seeing the provider. Uh, and it's not just like, a, oh, um, you know, running in, running out, uh, make sure all of your questions are, uh, are answered. That, that's kind of like the patient's bill of rights. So um, I just want to encourage people to do that. A lot of our patients through Home Rehab Network who have been in the hospital really, uh, I'm, you know, it's really encouraging to know that they are so empowered, uh, so confident uh, that they actually end up kind of um, almost managing their their own care so that that really um, is, is something that puts a smile on my face um, I have a question here uh, I'm 72 years old and I'm four feet ten inches my volume is 1500 uh, is that good or not uh, that's actually uh, not a bad volume uh, for your uh, um, for your height so it, it all depends uh, on uh, you know not everyone has the same size lung so you you have to kind of give it, um, you know, depending on your height, uh, you know, what, what it is. Some people, uh, you know, their lungs are they're taller, smaller. So um, another question, can you become dependent on oxygen or should you make your lungs work without it? Uh, Wanda, that's a really good question. So you do not become dependent on oxygen. Uh, that's really a... I don't know if that's misinformation or kind of a um, maybe 
kind of something that's that's false um, notion out there. Um, you do not, nobody ever becomes dependent on oxygen physiologically. Now, there are people that become dependent on oxygen psychologically. Uh, that's a separate issue. But physiologically, you do not become dependent on oxygen. Uh, you should not work out uh, without your oxygen. You should definitely uh, use uh, your oxygen, um, you know, when you need it. Um, and if you need it all the time, you should use it all the time. Uh, another question is, should I be taking B12 vitamins? Um, so B12, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty plentiful in the system. Um, for the most part, um, you know, if, if everything is pretty normal, you don't really have to take extra. Uh, if you have other issues, you may have to take uh, extra. But really, talk to your doctor about that. That's more of an individual issue. Um, been waiting a month to get in to see specialists. Uh, how do I go about finding a good specialist somewhere else? So these days, and that's kind of what I was saying about the hospitals, like it's, the hospitals are full, uh, the offices are full, you know, how do you really get, uh, get to see somebody, um, and then how do you get to see somebody good? Uh, I, I would say there, there's a couple, couple things. So one is um, you may elect to see somebody else in the practice uh, once uh, or twice just to kind of get in, and if there's an acute situation, uh, and then go back to your regular doctor, um, you know, have that already scheduled. And that, that's one way. Uh, sometimes a televisit is faster than an office visit, uh, so you may, may be able to do that. Um, uh, so typically, if you're stable, especially in COPD, you're probably seeing uh, someone every six months. Um, so in between, if you need to see somebody, uh, you could see a you know, maybe they have a nurse practitioner or a PA, uh, or maybe they have a, um, a televisit. Um, you know, you can continue with the every six months or every three months, or every four months, uh, but in between try to see someone else uh, just to kind of make sure that, that uh, you're being maintained. Um, been waiting a month to, okay. So uh, it's kind of hard these days meeting a patient, a uh, professional, yes, I ask questions, but uh, but it feels like they degrade you. Some say, well, you ask a lot of questions and most of my patients don't. It's a catch one. You know, that's really, that. that's a great point. Uh, a lot of doctors don't want to hear you. They, they don't want to listen to you. If that's the case, you know, if they don't have time for you, they're your doctor. Um, that to me is an automatic um, I'm going to try to find somebody else because, yes, you don't have time, but I'm, I'm your patient. Uh, you, you have to have time for me. You have to make that time. And, and if I'm asking questions, then you could either do this as a physician. Um, okay, I don't have time right now to listen to all the questions. I can answer the major ones. Uh, write down the other ones, and I will let you know the, the other questions as well. I mean, there's ways around it. I, I just don't find that a lot of physicians will be, you know, kind of, you know, overworked, obviously, and, and they have to see a lot of patients, but uh, there may be better ways to communicate. Um, Cheryl says, not sure if I have COPD. Uh, you know, that's something you want to talk to your doctor to see if you do have COPD or not. I have COPD and heart disease. Is it okay to buy over-the-counter stuff for mucus? Uh, the uh, most of the stuff is okay. Um, uh, the uh, decongestants, uh, and they're typically behind the counter, uh, sometimes can raise blood pressure um, and or heart rate. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the medications are mixed with uh, things that can cause drowsiness as well. Uh, so drowsiness can decrease your uh, rate of breathing. And that can, if you retain carbon dioxide, can increase your carbon dioxide. So that's something you want to watch out for. On the other hand, um, some of the decongestants, for example, if you're looking at uh, Claritin D or Allegra D or, or some of these D type of uh, medications can raise your blood pressure uh, and, and so that you have to be careful there. 
uh, honeycomb lung and fibrosis, can I get better? Um, so typically, Wanda, when you have honeycombing, um, honeycombing is a kind of a specific, uh, it, it happens in certain fibrotic uh, conditions. Not all fibrosis turns into honeycombing, uh, but honeycombing you cannot really get rid of. Uh, so the goal then is to try to improve the lung that you do have, the muscles around the lungs, and the muscles in general, blood flow, those kind of things is what you, we want to try to improve on. I have stage 4 emphysema with constant dry cough, no mucus. Will test on pearls work? Um, they may help, um, but, you know, the... the the issue is really what can you do more comprehensively um, uh, over, a, over a long period of time. So Telson pearls are good, uh, but you know, not, not good for like over a year or two years. I mean, the, the, you're going to have a chronic cough. Um, that may be part of it, but it shouldn't be the only thing. Try to make it kind of a, you know, talk to your doctor. There's a f new things about cough now that, that w weren't understood before. So. Um, talk to your pulmonologist about uh, chronic cough uh, and, and maybe have a, a few different options rather than just one thing. Um, annual pulmonary appointments, biometry results, 86%, then 88% within 15 minutes. Doc said go on oxygen, got up and left me in the chair. No suggesting, no, no suggesting pulmonary rehab. Um, None since 24 years ago, willing, able, going to fight back, want new pulmonary doc. Um, so uh, I guess uh, one of the issues there was the different spirometry values. You, you can have, um, uh, spirometry is kind of similar to blood pressure. Um, you can do it one time and then you can do it another time and there may be a slight discrepancy, uh, but that's called being in a range, so it's not always going to be a set number. Um, different days, different efforts uh, will, will set off a slightly different um, uh, values. So um, as long as the values are within a certain percentage, uh, they're still considered value, um, um, uh, appropriate uh, values. So uh, it, it all depends. Now, if you have one is way out of whack, then there's something wrong. But um, you know, the machine may be not calibrated right, um, or the machine's not working, or you're not putting in the effort, or you're putting in too much effort one time and not another. Um, there's different variables. Um, having a healthcare proxy in place and appointing someone you trust advocate on your behalf when you can't. Place on a ventilator shortly after arrival, ambulance to ICU, and my sister asked questions and made all decisions. Uh, so, Karen, um, very good point, um, especially um, uh, these days. Um, so, definitely talk to a loved one or some, someone that you trust uh, who can make decisions on your behalf. And what that means is, you know, we have a lot of patients in the ICU. Um, who are on ventilators or who are not doing very well, their family members have to make those decisions. Sometimes it's like a long lost son or daughter, uh, somebody estranged. I mean, it, it, it really shouldn't get to that point. Uh, those decisions should be based on what you would have wanted, not what somebody else would have wanted. So that's the other thing that's very key here. Um, a lot of people tend to be, you know, they have a lot of uh, guilty feelings that, oh, I'm doing such and such, but it really should be understood they're making that decision based on what you would have wanted, what they would have wanted. Um, and, and, and so that, that's, that's something that, that you should clarify beforehand. And, and, you know, in a chronic disease state, you should really have someone appointed. Um, you know, it's just like having a will or just like having, you know, kind of an estate set aside for someone. It, it's the same situation. You, you want someone to make th those decisions that you know are going to be making them for you and, and, and making the right decisions because they can really affect you in different ways. Um, I have COPD, only have one lung, right lung, removed in 1987, have not smoked since 1987. Can I improve my lung? Uh, the answer is yes, you can improve your lung. Um, you know, it's 
almost the same as uh, you know somebody doesn't have one arm or doesn't have one leg or doesn't have a, some fingers you know it, it's almost the same um, then the other side actually will uh, increase um, or can increase and the muscles around it will hypertrophy uh, to kind of uh, overcome so uh, the answer is yes um, what else hopefully I didn't miss any questions uh, but um, I want to get back to the uh, healthcare proxy uh, please a lot of people uh, you know if you're know that you're in a kind of a, a, a later stage uh, of your disease process um, you know you know talk to your family uh, or your friends or, or someone you trust you know and, and let them know that if um, I am put on life support you know this is how I want it to be handled do I want antibiotics do I want medications to keep my blood pressure normal do I want a ventilator do I want CPR do I you know do I want um, you know a tracheostomy or, or a feeding tube I mean these are the questions that really will come into play in those uh, situations and those are very difficult situations for people um, to be placed in especially if they don't know what you would have wanted uh, then it becomes you know what 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 should I do and and it, it really puts them in a very difficult um, uh, situation um, what else what other questions um, so uh, the other question was about um, you know your your um, uh, there's a new message on the bottom I can't see okay so um, Gary Ann is asking uh, how do you find out what stage you are you are in uh, so as far as uh, COPD um, it's really based on um, your uh, breathing test your, your pulmonary function test uh, and um, uh, there's two variables the main variable is called the FEV1 uh, or the force expiratory volume in the first second uh, so when they ask you to blow 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 that first second uh, actually is really a surrogate to um, to what your stage is um, now staging um, can sometimes be discouraging uh, you know if you're getting into stage three and stage four uh, stage four being the, the, the last stage um, that doesn't really mean that life is over so please don't uh, get hung up on one number um, you know there are ways to um, improve obviously pulmonary rehab is uh, uh, in my opinion one of the best ways because we're going to give you you know techniques we're going to give you um, understanding we're going to give you information we're going to do different exercises uh, so it's kind of a holistic approach uh, not just like okay here's an inhaler that may in help you improve your lung volume by 200 cc's so um, if you've been in our program and you're using this spirometer and you went from a thousand to two thousand cc's um, you know and your inhaler is only improving it to 200 cc's uh, at best uh, you know I mean there's just really no comparison so really um, pulmonary rehab is um, approved by most insurances from stage two to stage four uh, so if you are in those stages um, you should start thinking about pulmonary rehab um, the the other thing um, about pulmonary rehab is getting it early some people may feel like well I um, I can do certain things that's true but you don't know um, you don't know what you're doing <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is um, what you can get out of pulmonary rehab even though you're a stage two and you're pretty good at you know you're walking a mile or whatever um, but techniques of you know different techniques of how to breathe how to breathe in certain situations um, if you have mucus how to cough um, how to properly use your inhalers how to properly use your nebulizer how to properly use oxygen if you're on oxygen you know these are things that 
you, you won't really get um, proper teaching um, any other way. You, you really won't. Um, and watching, you know, maybe a, a YouTube video here or there um, it is not really the proper way, um, I think, to do it. So um, something that's more comprehensive, like Home Rehab Network, uh, where we go and, and teach all of these different aspects. You know, we're making uh, PhDs out of all of our, our, our patients, basically, right? Um, that gives them confidence, that give, that's empowering. Um, and that's better for the healthcare system, for the patient and for the system itself. That also improves your communication with your physician. And, uh, and so you can let them know, hey, I, I was here on the spirometer, now I'm here. This is where I was on my six-minute walk test. Here's where I am now. Uh, this is what I could do before, and here's where I am. So, you know, it makes it a better um, kind of uh, interaction with the physician. Uh, Denise is saying, I'm 72 and was in a uh, hospital six months with COVID. I'm on oxygen diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis. I had three chest tubes in the hospital. So, Denise... Um, uh, I worked in the uh, in the ICU during this whole COVID thing, and I put in many chest tubes. Um, so the the first thing is, you know, congratulations, you're 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 alive because a lot of people actually didn't make it. Um, the second is it's a very difficult time now uh, that you're going through. Uh, a lot of patients didn't really have any lung issues, and now post COVID, especially those uh, such as yourself. Uh, who have been in the hospital for a long time uh, and have developed, you know, scarring in the lungs. Um, the good news is that typically the COVID uh, scarring is not progressive. So that's one good news. And typically, uh, once the inflammation around that scarring is um, kind of gets subdued, that may take uh, some time, maybe even a year, maybe a year and a half, um, then a lot of your uh, breathing may improve. Uh, the chest tubes per se, um, you know, they're, they're caused by, uh, you know, leaks. Uh, those uh, won't impact you on the long term for the most part. Uh, so, Denise, just patient, uh, and definitely, you know, if you're in our program, great. If you're not, you know, try to find a pulmonary rehab program. Uh, it is very helpful, very helpful. Uh, but just know that uh, there is some, um, you know, there is light at the, at the end of the tunnel here, meaning that uh, th th there is, you know, a lot of improvement uh, in, in patients with uh, um, uh, COVID-related lung disease. So that, that's a very good, uh, good sign. Um, Severe obstruction, borderline significant air trapping. So, Samantha, um, with air trapping and obstruction, you could think about the valves, the, the lung valves. Um, also, exercise, um, optimization of inhalers. So, uh, again, the things that we try to teach here at Home Rehab Network uh, with our pulmonary rehab uh, could definitely benefit you. Um, but um, those are ways to decrease uh, air trapping. Um, so, uh, going back a little bit to the, uh, to the COVID, um, uh, question, um, some people unfortunately do develop pulmonary fibrosis. A lot of people do not develop pulmonary fibrosis, but still have significant fatigue and shortness of breath and, uh, memory fog. Those are really the three things that I see a lot, uh, or hear a lot of, um, the good news again brain fog, uh, fatigue, and, um, and the shortness of breath um, will resolve um, over a period of time to a certain percentage, meaning uh, they may not 100% resolve, but mostly they will resolve, but it will just take time. So um, that's kind of good news for a lot of COVID uh, 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 patients. Uh, would you suggest your patients getting the COVID vaccine? Um, you know, there are certain patients I would definitely suggest getting COVID vaccine, um, you know, those that are really at high risk uh, for, um, 
for getting COVID and, and if they do get COVID uh, for uh, long-term uh, you know, um, uh, d disability uh, with COVID. So there are certain patients I would definitely recommend uh, getting the vaccine. I've read some good things about uh, lung volume reduction uh, surgery. Uh, when can it be used and is it effective? So uh, LVRS uh, candy, as you mentioned, um, uh, the, I think when I was a fellow, uh, there was a trial called the NET trial, N-E-T-T. -T. Uh, that was the initial trial that showed a benefit in certain patients uh, getting lung volume reduction surgery. Um, now we have the valves, so it's kind of called BLVRS instead of LVRS. Uh, so they deploy these valves uh, in, in those areas rather than cutting it out. The issue with, with uh, surgery for lung volume reduction, there was still some morbidity and mortality um, attached to it. So uh, it, it kind of fell out of favor. Now with the valves being less invasive, uh, it's kind of coming back, uh, and in appropriate patients, uh, works very well. Uh, so if you are a candidate, we definitely uh, would recommend uh, looking into lung valves. Uh, the surgery is um, uh, something I wouldn't really, um, you know, that's something that you would have to talk to your, your physician about. Uh, but getting evaluated for the lung valves is definitely uh, something I would be in favor of. Very good questions, very good questions. I'm really encouraged. These are, these are excellent questions. Um, uh, I was also on a ventilator four times in six months. Um, so Denise, um, if you're on a ventilator four times in six months, uh, first of all, you're gonna be deconditioned, so you definitely need pulmonary rehab. The second is, um, you know, what was causing you to have this? Was uh, if you have COPD, um, is, is there a certain, um, you know, are you getting pneumonia? And if you are, uh, if that's triggering the COPD and causing you to be on a ventilator, uh, then sometimes you can be colonized with certain bacteria. Um, and if we know what that bacteria is, for example, Pseudomonas is a very common bacteria that can be colonized and it keeps coming back, keeps coming back. Uh, if we know what it is, <coughs> We can maybe give you antibiotics beforehand uh, as soon as you're starting to get some, uh, um, as soon as you're starting to get in that exacerbated state, meaning starting to get more short of breath or the mucus is thicker or it's changed color or consistency, uh, you want to get on those antibiotics. The other is sometimes I recommend um, uh, azithromycin uh, three times a week. Um, to, to, to my patients as a prophylaxis. Uh, some patients may require prednisone on a daily basis. So uh, there's a few things that you should be looking into uh, to try to prevent the next time you get into on a ventilator. Uh, there's also what's called non-invasive ventilation that you can do at home. Uh, and that's another thing that you can look at uh, through your, with your doctor. Um, I didn't have a proxy at the time, do now. 50 years old and mild asthma, caught my son's cold, um, MSSA, strep, and uh, HMPV, cavitary pneumonia, sepsis. I just thought I had bad bronchitis, did not know the signs of sepsis, uh, tension pneumo after extubated. Uh, so you had a very difficult time. Um, so Certain bacteria will cause cavitary pneumonia. Cavitary meaning there's a cavity, which means basically there's a hole uh, that's being created by the, uh, by the bacteria. Uh, typically, antibiotics are given over a period of time, and that closes up that hole. Um, so I'm flying to Florida in three weeks. I have four COVID shots. Should I get the fifth uh, before I go? Um, yes, you should get the fifth before you go. You should wear a mask uh, if you are immunocompromised, especially in the, uh, in the plane, uh, if you can, uh, and obviously in the airport. Um, I have severe emphysema and COPD stage four and on five liters oxygen, what would you recommend? Um, so as far as um, 
uh, obviously I recommend pulmonary rehab. That's, that would be the first thing. Uh, make sure you're on the right amount, uh, right, right types of uh, inhalers or nebulizers. Uh, if you are not able to uh, inhale with the uh, inhaler adequately, then maybe a nebulizer would be more effective for you. Uh, make sure you have good mucus clearance. Uh, make sure you're uh, on a good uh, proper diet with good amount of protein um, and uh, replacing you know, those amino acids and, and the vitamins. Uh, so diet, uh, rehab, uh, your uh, inhalers and nebulizers, and the proper amount of oxygen. Uh, those are the four things that I would recommend um, in that severe state. Now, having said that, uh, going back to the valve issue, uh, if you are trapping air and you have severe emphysema, uh, you may be a candidate for, um, uh, for the lung valves, uh, the Zephyr valves. Um, and um, so you can, uh, you can actually go on, um, uh, I think, the Pulmonix uh, website, uh, and uh, they actually have... Uh, a listing of physicians that are doing these procedures uh, and, and you can find them state by state. Um, what else? Very good questions. Um, can asthma improve with the rehab uh, after extensive pneumonia that caused uh, scar tissue? Um, going back to that question, um, so asthma per se unfortunately is not covered by most insurances for pulmonary rehab. Uh, but, but certain, uh, like chronic obstructive asthma is. Post pneumonia probably is. So my, my, the answer is yes. But, um, you, you know, then we have to go through the insurance. So, um, so does the smart vest work? Uh, Diane, in my opinion, the smart vest does work. And it's not the only vest. Uh, Hillrom has a vest, and there's a couple other vests out there. Uh, I actually uh, am a believer in the, the vest. Uh, what it does is basically causes um, certain hertz of vibration uh, to go through uh, into the, 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 the bronchi, throughout the chest really, but uh, into the bronchi to shake up uh, the mucus. Uh, what happens is in, um, in COPD or what's called bronchiectasis, in COPD, the cilia or the hair-like mechanism to bring the mucus up uh, is being, has been destroyed or, or damaged. And so you cannot uh, have that cilia, which look like little hairs, uh, to kind of push up your, uh, the, the mucus. A a and so a lot of people have to hack really hard to get a little bit of mucus uh, out. And that's really what's happening. It's because, uh, one, the cilia, the, the hair-like projections, are not working. Two, there may be thickening of the bronchial wall. Uh, three, the muscles uh, in the bronchial wall uh, or around it uh, may be collapsing. What's called uh, uh, dynamic airway collapse. So basically, when you cough, sometimes um, if you've had recurrent infections, that muscle gets weak that's wrapped around the, the tubing. And instead of staying open when you cough, it closes. So if you have mucus uh, and you're trying to get it out, but the, the bronchi close each time, uh, you're really not going to get it out. So the vest is very good in that uh, to help mobilize uh, those secretions. Uh, that's um, also in bronchiectasis, something very similar also happens there as well. Although in bronchiectasis, you may be making excess mucus. Uh, am I able to use nebulizer and take um, Trilogy, a couple hours later to combat deep coughing and lungs. Yeah, so Trilogy is once a day. Uh, so your nebulizer is typically, depending on what you put in it, uh, can be, you know, one, two, three, or four times a day. It all depends. Uh, but yes, uh, you can um, use it in conjunction. Uh, can those hairs improve when you quit smoking? Um, the hairs don't really improve, but the hairs then don't get damaged that are already there. So um, there is some improvement, uh, but um, the ones that are really destroyed, you can't really bring them back. Um, will the air physio get the mucus out, up and out? Um, the air physio, so it can help, but um, uh, there are multiple techniques to get that mucus out. So don't just use one one technique. So for example, if we go back to the vest, 
um, or if you use a flutter. Typically, uh, insurances want you to use a flutter type of device. If that doesn't work, then they can use a vest. So you can use a flutter with a vest. Uh, and then sometimes they'll add uh, nebulized saline so they can have uh, uh, 0.9%, 3%, 7%. And that, that's something you can talk to your doctor about. But uh, along with uh, something like mucinex. So you want to thin out the mucus, that's the mucinex and also the saline to moisten and thin it out. And then, um, you know, to get it out and mobilize it would be, uh, you know, some type of a flutter device or a vibrating vest. Uh, so th those are the ways to, to kind of get the, uh, the, the mucus out. Yes, during plenty of fluids, um, a lot of COPD patients are really dry, uh, meaning that they're physiologically dry. Uh, so they really need to take in a lot more fluids. Now, having said that, if you have kind of, concomitant uh, cardiac disease, meaning heart failure or right heart failure, uh, then you have to be very careful as far as, far as fluid intake. Uh, what is BLVRS and is it uh, surgery? What can I use for the mucus, severe COPD and asthma on uh, two inhalers and antihistamine at night every uh, eight weeks? So uh, Justine, there's a couple of questions there. Uh, BLVRS uh, or bronchoscopic uh, lung volume reduction um, is not a surgery. Uh, it's basically uh, kind of knocking you out uh, in a lot of institutions down, and then they'll go down with the scope, uh, and then, uh, well, before that even happens, they will kind of map out an area where they feel you need the valves. Once that's mapped out, you've had a cardiac evaluation. Uh, you've obviously had a pulmonary evaluation. Um, it's mapped out, you're ready to go, and they, they may um, elect to uh, intubate you, maybe put the tube in, and then in uh, the, the long hose, as you might, might call it, uh, which is the bronchoscope, and then they will deploy these valves. They look like little um, upside down umbrellas almost. Uh, so they deploy these and um, the valves right. Uh, for that that area, um, and um, and once that's done, then then basically the point of this is the um, that area is hyperinflated, has a lot of air, and so the valve causes the area to squeeze, uh, or not squeeze, but the the air to come out, but not go back in. So so it it, it actually decreases uh, the um, um, size. Uh, of that part of the lung that's not really functioning well, which was squeezing the, the good lung. So that bad lung is getting squeezed down, and the good lung is, is getting, you know, it's taking over in that space. So that, that's kind of the theory uh, of the, the lung valves. Um, now you have a lot of mucus as well. You're on two inhalers and antihistamine. The antihistamine may be drying you out, so the one thing with antihistamines are you know, if you need them, you need them. Uh, but if you don't, then try not to take them, um, especially Benadryl. If you're trying to take Benadryl at night, um, not a good medication for sleeping, although it will put you to sleep. But uh, there are links with dementia, uh, memory loss. Uh, so, you know, talk to your doctor about that. Uh, I've seen my pulmonologist three times in three years. Sometimes he doesn't even listen to my lungs in and out in 10 minutes. Um, what can I tell you? <laughs> that is uh, someone that you probably uh, want to switch. Uh, I have uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Should I use my nebulizer? I stopped, stopped it about three months ago. Uh, so Darlene, um, the nebulizer in the situation of IPF may or may not really help. Um, because we're not dealing with uh, lungs that are just not very compliant. We're dealing with stiff lungs. Uh, and, and so um, it, it typically tends not to help, uh, especially in the, uh, as you get more scarred, uh, nebulizers tend not to help. Or, and, and so um, if it wasn't helping, then I would say just stop. Uh, what causes the nosebleed? So, uh, Diane, nosebleeds, I assume you're on oxygen um, because nosebleeds can be from many different things, but oxygen 
uh, would typically dry out the uh, the nose, especially the, the middle of the nose, which has most of the blood vessels, uh, and uh, those tiny uh, blood vessels uh, with increased pressure from, let's say, coughing or breathing hard, um, along with being very dry skin, uh, kind of uh, rough skin, uh, just, they just burst, and that, that really causes uh, the, uh, uh, the nosebleed. So uh, nasal saline uh, several times a day, non-petroleum jelly uh, several times a day. Uh, if you can, give your nose a break, meaning take the oxygen off uh, if you can. Uh, if you can't, you can't, but some people can when they're sitting, can take off the oxygen, take a break from it. That would be another, another way to do it. Best way to rid lungs deep, dry cough. Um, so the question is, uh, what is really causing that cough? Uh, is it allergies? Is it asthma? Is it COPD? Uh, many reasons uh, uh, to have that cough. So um, again, we talked about cough earlier. Um, not just, don't use one thing. Use several different things uh, to, to kind of uh, attack your cough. Um, Sharon, ask your doctor uh, about that. Um, and th th there's some data suggest uh, Neurontin or Gabapentin can also help uh, certain types of chronic cough. So um, talk to your doctor about that. Uh, why constant runny nose? Uh, so uh, uh, Linda, uh, you're asking the, the runny nose question. So if you're on oxygen, uh, what it does is tickles uh, your cranial nerve number three that causes uh, this uh, runny nose. Uh, so try to adjust the nasal cannula uh, and try to bend it a little bit um, t so it's not hitting that, that uh, nerve. But uh, a lot of times you can't do much, much about that. Uh, I don't have mucus. I don't have a cough, but was told I have COPD stage four. Do you agree I'm in gold uh, stage? So um, you can have COPD stage four and not have a cough and not have mucus. You can just have shortness of breath. Uh, so that's not um, a criteria. Uh, the staging, again, is on based on your lung function. It's not really based upon um, uh, the symptoms. It's a different scale that, that takes those into account. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the gold staging um, is based on, uh, on the uh, pulmonary function test. I have 20% of lung function left. Would the valve help or is it uh, too late? So um, surely the valve would definitely help, uh, but you have to be assessed. Make sure that you're a candidate for the valve. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a there's, a pr there's a process, uh, a, a series of tests that have to be done to determine that you're a candidate for valve or not. Uh, and um, typically what happens is uh, your primary pulmonologist may refer you on uh, to one of these uh, pulmonologists, which, what are called interventional pulmonologists, uh, and they're the ones that actually put the valves in. Uh, they will do the, uh, 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 they will do the, uh, you know, uh, workup for it. Um, again, typically it's your PFTs and a CAT scan, and then they have a, a way to analyze that CAT scan, and then uh, they want to get an echo and a cardiology evaluation and a few other things, but typically those are the things that they want to see. Uh, then if you're a candidate for the valve, then, then they will deploy them in those areas. Um, I take uh, Facenra shot every eight weeks. Uh, am I on a good pass? Uh, the nighttime med is Montelukas. Can you take a shower on oxygen? Uh, so uh, typically, most people take their, their oxygen off uh, when they're taking a shower. Um, can you have it on? I mean, if you need to have it on, then, then, then you, you, you have to have it on. Uh, some people sit down and take a shower. Uh, some people take off their oxygen and take a shower. Uh, so that kind of depends. Now, uh, one thing is uh, condensation in the tubing. Um, that's something you have to watch out for. Uh, getting water in the tubing, um, or getting the tubing uh, kind of um, dirty. Uh, sometimes you can get, you know, bacteria or fungus in there. So that's what you have to worry about in the shower. Um, as far as Facenra, Facenra is more for 
either asthma or what we call overlap, uh, COPD asthma overlap syndrome. Uh, and um, and it, it's a pretty good drug, uh, depending on, you know, uh, if, you're correct, if you meet the criteria for it. Uh, I've seen good results with it. Um, all right, very good. I can take one more question. Uh, we're going to wrap up pretty soon. Uh, but um, I'm very encouraged. These are very good questions. Uh, so, you know, continue to, um, you know, we're, I'm here every, every two weeks. Uh, Alex is here uh, twice, uh, twice a week. So, you know, we encourage as many questions as possible. We love questions. We love answering questions. Uh, hopefully I've answered most of the questions. Uh, again, uh, this is for your information. Talk to your doctor, um, you know, um, before you do anything, uh, make sure you have your doctor's blessings um, uh, to, uh, to change up anything. Uh, but um, pulmonary rehab, again, Home Rehab Network, I think is probably one of the best rehab programs out there, if not the best programs out there. So please look us up, call us, get enrolled, and get involved. Um, because I think you really need to get involved with your own healthcare uh, to, to have any kind of meaningful outcomes. Uh, and this is for you. It's, this is not for me. It's not for anybody else. So uh, thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Take care. I'll see you in a couple of weeks.